writing about the rich from Gatsby to Starry Nights. And we have a wonderful panel today that I'd love to introduce for you. And first of all, I'd just like to thank our sponsor. We're presented here today by Patrika Game Changer Series. So I'm going to begin with Rachel. Now, Rachel Johnson has worked for national newspapers since the age of 23. She's written four novels and two volumes of diaries. She's a co-presenter of Sky News' The Pledge, and she contributes to many newspapers such as The Times and many other publications, and apparently is a rock music critic. Now, next on our panel is Shobha Di. She has, for over four decades, written extensively on India's socio-cultural political contours. She has authored over 20 books, many bestsellers, including Starry Nights, and her latest book, 70, and to hell with it. She's a prolific writer and a columnist, blogger, social commentator, and opinion shaper. And our final panelist who will be in conversation with these two wonderful women is Siddharth Danvat Shangvi. He's the author of The Last Song of Dusk, and is an which is an international bestseller. And his work has been translated into 16 different languages. He's been nominated for and won many international awards and prizes. And his most recent book is The Rabbit and the Squirrel. Please will you join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. You've got notes. I do have notes. Good, you better start. <laughs> Shobha, is that okay with you? Oh, uh, we're counting on it. So, you know, last year I came to uh, JLF with my grandmother. And this year it's the mothership. And if I'm completely incoherent, it's because Shobha has been screaming at me last night for 45 minutes about how badly behaved I am and where various <laughs> errors that I have made across all of the time that we have known each other. So I'm suitably uh, uh, um, contrite and uh, chastened, and I'm going to uh, behave myself going forward. Oh, no, please don't. <laughs> that would be extremely boring, and uh, no, no, no. We want you to be you. Okay. Do not behave yourself for a moment. All right. So, um, you know, there, there was a change in the format. Originally, I was supposed to moderate the conversation and ask uh, Shobha and Rachel, and then there was a change where they said we would all speak. So I just picked up a few thoughts, and I'm going to share them with a far more distinguished panel that I'm lucky enough to be seated next to. Uh, a book that had great resonance with me was Less Than Zero by Brett Esten Ellis, you know, set in uh, America in the 80s with characters like Clay and Julian. That book was about a bunch of overprivileged Americans, very rich, uh, lost in a maze of uh, moral vacuum and of the privilege that came with their Californian lives. That book had a great resonance with me because at that point I was living in Bombay and I was able to bear witness by default or by accident of my life as a writer to a bunch of very powerful, very well-known, very rich families. And it was a kind of life where you would see you know, people on their private jets cutting lines of coke. You'd see, I remember one year we'd gone to Ibiza and the amount of money that this family spent on one night was what I had made as an annual income. So it was that kind of really toxic privilege that I was privy to and that's why this book had such a resonance to me. But two things that stayed with me with Ellis's work one was that the easiest thing you can do when you're writing about rich people is to trivialize them. You know, they can become a motif of uh, embarrassment, of mockery. You can say, you know, um, what are their lives? Going from party to party, champagne glass to champagne glass, drugs to drugs. But the, the genius of Ellis's work was that he exfoliates each character so profoundly um, and so carefully that by the end of the book you're left with the hollowness of their lives. And then what you find yourself is just swimming in love and sympathy for these people who have been defaced, who are nothing but the shell and the idea of all that they could be. I often thought, what if that kind of a novel was set in India? You know, the less than zero, which I guess Shobha will talk about maybe. But in America, at the core of Ellis's book 
was a sense of spiritual poverty, spiritual privatization. India, which is distinguished by uh, cultural sophistication, by um, a kind of spiritual integrity, what drove my friends from that milieu in Bombay in 2000s to that kind of a brink that was completely, it was like watching a mirror uh, of Ellis's work set in India. And because Shobha is an elder in my literary family, I'm going to allow her to perhaps help me answer that question because I know she can do a much better job. Uh, thank you, Siddharth, and thank you all for being here. And thank you, JLF, for providing such an amazing platform. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, and the entire team, and most of all, the volunteers, because without the volunteers, a, a, a festival of this kind is really, really hard to manage. So, having said that, I hope they invite me back again and again and again. I don't think I've missed a single JLF, and it's always a very, very special moment. To answer your question, um, Siddharth, since you provided a, a small background to your life, maybe it's uh, important that I provide a little nugget about my own and uh, why I wrote the first book and then the second book and subsequently the other books that followed. I came from a very middle class Maharashtrian bureaucratic family. Uh, there was nothing uh, about our lives which was extravagant. If anything, it was austere and uh, every rupee counted because Unlike today's day and age, my father happened to be an honest bureaucrat with four children to raise. And uh, every rupee went towards educating his four children. So I simply did not grow up with privilege or a sense of entitlement. However, for over 43 years now, I have lived the life of what may be described loosely as, and very carelessly uh, sometimes, as the elite India. And Every single country, every single culture has its elite, and it's not only about money. If you ask me, the most privileged people in India, and certainly the most elite, are our politicians, because they have no accountability. And uh, the rest of us, uh, for us, uh, speaking for myself and my husband, we are self-made. We've made our money. We've worked very hard to be where we are. So absolutely no apologies for any of it. So if we can afford to have a nice -ish car, uh, we haven't stolen anyone's money to acquire that car. And if at 71, I do have a few indulgences, I have worked very hard, continue to work very hard and pay for them. So we have to make that distinction about the rich in India or anywhere in the world. They are not some alien creatures who have descended from some other galaxy. They are human beings. They're like you and me, except like uh, Fitzgerald pointed out, they just have more money. That's the only difference, really. So to be taking a position which most writers feel obliged to take, to somehow, like you mentioned the word mockery, or to damn them, or to pile on guilt. Why should wealth generate guilt? I don't understand that. Why should the wealthy in novels and fiction be made to suffer in the end. Why can't they just enjoy what they have, what they've made? I mean, it's a, a privilege, yes. Because everybody starts somewhere. If the Rockefellers, they were called robber barons, but eventually they went on to create what they created. The wealthy are also wealth creators. And in India, for heaven's sake, it's not the 2000, the people you're talking about, the California transported into Mumbai, uh, are Maharajas. Um, India has known wealth for centuries. Till, of course, the British came and stripped us off it. But till then, wealth was something we, we yeah. took, we had, uh, we lived with, uh, coexisted. It's not about suddenly a writer being asked to justify why are you writing about this particular segment of society and why not any other. Maybe there are those of us who do write about every segment of society and they are a part of society. They have a validity also. They have uh, uh, an identity. And I see no reason why they should be excluded from any kind of a conversation about society in a larger context. So if I write, and I did, it was A, my first book, which I can still say that, and with complete and total transparency and honesty. At that point, 40 years ago, I was, and I still am, completely fascinated and riveted by how the rich lived. It was a life which was beyond fantasy. 
that not even fiction could capture in quite the way one experienced it and saw it. In fact, my first book was a very vivid representation of an aspirational India and an India segment of our society, particularly in Mumbai, which the people even within Mumbai, outside the charmed circle, did not even know existed. They thought I had made up all the characters. And we do, in fact, have an area in Mumbai where a lot of very wealthy people live called Malabar Hill. And that was very much central to my book because the lives of the people I was writing about, most of them lived in Malabar Hill. And I, the critics went at me saying, it's not possible. She's made it all up. And she's just transposed Beverly Hills and given it another name and called it Malabar Hill because it sounds more fascinating and exotic. But anyone can come to Mumbai. Malabar Hill existed way back then. It exists now. It still has wealthy people. And I'm still fascinated. Well, I would not like to say. Thank, well done, Shoba. This is my first time in, in, not in India, but in Jaipur and at the JLF. And as you can imagine, it's truly hardcore and it's such fun to be here. And thank you to the volunteers, especially the one who gave me my jacket because I was so cold. <laughs> thank you. I also wrote my first trilogy, in fact, my only trilogy of novels um, about the super rich in West London. And I completely agree, this, it's the, the super rich is an interconnected global elite. 10 years ago or seven years ago when I was asked to come to this festival by Willie Dalrymple, who sadly can't be here because his father died very recently. And he invited me to come and then he canceled me and he said, I just don't think India I don't think Jaipur audiences will understand your books about the Notting Hill super rich. Now, in those intervening years, there has been a complete reversal of fortunes. My country is committing economic suicide, whereas India is going to be the next superpower with China and America. So you totally get it now. I arrived in India in Mumbai and I drove through the Malabar Hills district and our taxi driver pointed to me to that tower and he said this was built by a rich businessman for his family and three children this entire tower I think it's now got a few more families in it the Antilia Tower 27 floors yes 27 floors Four, and he said five in members the, the helipad on the roof and then there's the gym and then there's the cars and then right in the basement you've got the, the recreation the chill out zone for the kids all that space for one family and you said that the reason why there is antagonism towards the super rich is because the 1% has half the national wealth. In order to be in that 1% in India, you, you make 32,000 a year. An average salary in India is 2,000 a year. The inequality in India is astonishing. Much higher, it's like, you know, Probably China and India are the richest, most higher economies in the world, but the inequality is growing. And this is why when you write about the super rich, people think it's unsympathetic. It's very difficult to write sympathetic characters, to give them, I thought your word was brilliant, to exfoliate the characters so you can see past the wealth, the bank balance, the rich kids of Instagram, the, the things, the labels that clutter and clot your prose if you're writing about the rich <coughs> put off the reader they, the reader cannot identify and relate to the, to the rich because they are not like us as F. Scott Fitzgerald said they have more money and my editor at Penguin she begged and begged and begged me she said please don't write too rich and somebody said I can't remember who that happiness writes white yeah. but if you write rich you're aware of something happening to your prose, some toxic quality comes into it because it's about consumerism, it's about appearance, it's about lifestyle. And what actually is interesting about fiction is character and plot and, and, and fa family friction, which is why we've seen an interesting development, which is that there aren't so many really brilliant novels about the rich that I can tell you about or 
we can discuss. But actually on television, the rich, the rich is a brilliant subject. And we have succession, for example, about a kind of faux Murdoch dynasty, which is compulsive. And then we have the, the one about the Getty family, which is called Trust. And I'm sure some of you have seen these, these box sets. They are gripping because what is gripping is not how rich they are, but how difficult it is to be very rich and how the money is so polluting. And once money comes into a family, the problems come into a family. And that's what's interesting about the rich is, you know, it's like little small children, small problems, big children, big problems. Well, little money, that's a big problem if you've got no money. But if you've got an enormous amount of money, then you've got a family problem. You've got a dynastic problem. You've got fraud. You've got people taking advantage. You've got women who don't think men love them because of their appearance. And you've got men who know that uh, the only reason young women are going to bed with them is because they're rich. Different problems. The rich are different. You know, Rachel, when you're saying that, one thing that came to mind um, and was a takeaway from that set that I bore witness to in Bombay yeah. was that I was lucky enough to have enough money to simplify my life. And they had so much money that it complicated theirs. And that also became my relationship with fame, that I wanted to have enough acknowledgement to be able to call up the right doctor and that they would see me, but not so much that I wouldn't be able to, to set it, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to step out. And that was one thing that I recognized from being in that world, is that, you know, you have to keep that distance. You know, I spent last um, summer in, in, in uh, Paris working, and of course I was reading a lot of Proust in the evening. Of course. Right? And um, Proust, remembrance of things past, dazzling, dull as dal. Um, but here was a man who was essentially a society dandy, who would go back home and transcribe the gossip that he had, you know, gleaned from an afternoon salon conversation. Um, who was very aware of the politics of that world. You know, how do you get to know a duke? How do you hang out in that space? What do you do to be invited again? And that became nourishment for his novels. The two thoughts within that, and, and you know, you can help me expand on that, was towards the end of Proust's life, um, he would go to brothels. And he wasn't, he would ask for an isolated room where somebody would release two hungry bandicoots, rats, mm. who would then fight and tear each other apart and squeal, while the great author, was sitting on a bed, pleasuring himself. And what that said to me was that much proximity to the world of the super rich and aspiring to that can only deaden you to very profound and real pleasures. You know, here was a man who had seen so much that at the end of the day, that very vital aspect of his life had been extinguished by privilege. And the only way that he could attain that moment of uh, significant brief joy was in, in the slaughter of these, of these rats. So well, that was one thing. And the other thing, and, and I know that the two of you will help me expand on this, is, and especially Shobha, is I wonder where are the serious novels from India which look at similar subjects, you know, the, the lives of the super wealthy? Will that ever earn a place in the literary canon? And I wonder why is it a form of latent racism that insists we must never imagine people from India as super rich, people from India in the driving seat, people from India holding and setting the conversation forth. So is that why that you know Western publishers are just unable to, to imagine not just Malabarel, but you know, those are little pockets everywhere. You go to Chandigarh, you know, you, you'll have that, you go to Nagpur, and there's you know a realm of all of that. And there has always been a currency for a certain kind of Indian novel. And this is the one, you know, with the snakes and the jungles and the magic and the oppression and the caste, intercaste love stories. It makes me think that this is the story that does not disturb the Occidental dinner party. You know, this is not someone that a kind of narrative it forces you to think that, you know, these are the people who are going to be setting the conversation agenda, so deal with it. Um, I found that very interesting. Is that something you can help me clarify? Well, I'm glad you did raise this, because when I first started writing my first novel, and uh, 
the literary agents abroad were very disappointed with it because they said, well, you can write, yes, but what about a book about oppression? And then I started to joke about it each time I got a call from an, an agent. So I said, so are you looking for a book about oppression, depression, repression, suppression? And a woman who's been married at uh, age six and who's been beaten uh, every day by an alcoholic husband. I said, you've come to the wrong writer. Uh, there were many cliches about India. There still are, uh, there's a plethora of cliches about India. And yes, the Western agent is still looking for those stories. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to oblige anybody. I will write the book that I want to write on my terms, the way I see it, the life I've lived. It has to be a truthful representation of what you have experienced, what you have felt, what your insights are. And it cannot be something that's written artificially to, for example, written uh, like a command uh, for a certain market segment so that you can be invited to the Frankfurt Book Fair and tell everybody about the terrible life you've led and about the terrible condition of women in India. I mean, there are books about that. They, those are realities. Nobody but nobody is going to challenge those realities, question those realities. Any sensitive person, any sensitive writer will respond to them in his or her own fashion. Not because an agent says, and finally, they, when, when all else failed, they said, can't you just throw in an American or something for a, a romantic angle with you know, a poor Indian village girl who meets an American man when he's in Jaipur? And I said, yes, and, and, and or Varanasi. And you know, love happens uh, in the shadow of a camel or an elephant. I mean, these are the books that are uh, were almost dictated to by agents, and I refuse to write those. Decadence is something which is a very powerful subject for most writers to explore. And we have a rich history of writing about decadence in Bengal and movies uh, uh, about decadence. Uh, I mean, when uh, the, the music room is by far the most perfect comment and almost, an, almost a perfect film which explores decadence of the, of the zamindars, the, the landed aristocracy in Bengal in their last final dying hours. Fantastic. Those people had much more money than all the people we're talking about right now. So for each writer, I think you choose your subject uh, because, because you, this, yeah. that is the subject that you want to explore in all its nuances and all its depth. It's not a one-dimensional story, or oh, rich man meets uh, another rich woman and the two of them uh, have a rollicking affair and they go off to the ski slopes in Stad and produce a beautiful child who is now, of course, in, in a, Yes, exactly. So uh, I, I think we are entitled to, to explore our worlds on, a, in, in our, on our own terms. And the only people who can actually pass judgment on your work in any context are your readers and nobody else. Well, I think there's a lot of cultural stereotyping and I think there's still this trope that the rich are in some way rotten and the poor are in some way much more pure. <laughs> but I think this is changing. I mean, in, you know, we don't just want to read novels about the aristocracy in England and we don't just want to read novels about uh, poor Indian girls meeting Maharajas uh, in India. Vikram Sait long ago wrote about the Indian middle class. Yeah. Um, but it is changing, and uh, one big thing in England has been, well, in fact, globally, has been crazy rich yeah. Asia. And I was recently asked to do, or pro pitched to do a series called Crazy Rich Asians, in which I went around and I met the real families, the bolligarchs yeah. um, in, in, of India. And uh, I thought, what would be interesting about that? Um, really, what would they say? Would they, they wouldn't want me to expose their wealth. They, you know, the rich are very private with very good reason. The Sunday Times, which is a newspaper I used to work for, had a Sunday Times rich list in which you know, they had a whole team of people working out how rich everybody was. And actually, a lot of the rich people paid PR consultants not to be on the Sunday Times rich list, but a lot of other people paid people to make sure that they, their ranking had gone up. You know, there's a very um, antipathetical relationship of the rich to their money because they know that money is power and people are drawn to money, as, as I mentioned earlier. You know, rich men 
you know, exp why do they have young women on their arm? You know, we know why, you know, it's power. Money is power in this country and in my country. Um, uh, Rachel, taking off from what you just said about the rich list, uh, I have a very good and dear friend who actually does compile the rich list out of India. And I know what a tough job she has because unlike, unlike what one imagines, you, see, you talked about the privacy of the rich and how they guard their privacy and they don't necessarily want to flash their wealth. Well, this is a new India. It's exactly the opposite. She is hounded night and day with people sending in their balance sheets. <laughs> and also, not just that, they want to be on that list. Yeah. And then the top dogs who are in the first five, if in the next uh, list, the number one guy has become number two or number three, they call her up and they say, how could you? You got your number, you got your math all wrong. I deserve to be number one. I'm going to call your editors in New York. I'm going to complain about this. And then there are all the other very aspirational, extremely ambitious, and extremely successful people who, who they give anything to be featured on the list. Because the minute you get onto the list, it opens the doors yeah. to That's so right. much privilege. And you, you know, you're at the high table in Davos, for example. And that seems to be the ultimate goal and this badge of respectability, acceptance, and that you have arrived. If you're invited there, you're at the high table. It gives a lot of rich people a huge, big high. So these rich lists are there with a certain cold-blooded calculation. It's uh, to provide an ego massage uh, to people who don't really need one, mm. but this is their ultimate high and is their ultimate trip. What do you think, Siddharth? So, you know, Shobha, I have to uh, very respectfully disagree. I think Davos, The Guardian recently, uh, somebody called it the after party for people who are ruining the world. And I think it's yeah. true. Yeah. I think the kind of absurd, vulgar privilege um, that is exhibited there universally, whether it's the Russians, the Americans who go there, the Indians who go there. And, um, and connecting back to the other point, you know, I'm very embarrassed by, by the kind of show of wealth that is there in India. You know, you live in a country with such extreme poverty, you know, where millions of children um, live in almost sub-Saharan levels of malnutrition. For you to exhibit that much wealth, whether at a wedding or because you have a big house, um, I don't think it's showing off. I think it's a failure of your humanity because you're not being able to recognize the humanity of someone else. I think people are completely entitled to have a celebration of their choice. People are entirely entitled to have uh, you know, a wedding where they invite uh, somebody from abroad to come and sing and dance and all of that. But the fact that you don't recognize that so many people around you are suffering, you know, um, to me, it, it's, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. And it's also, you know, when you were speaking about Davos, there was Nirav Modi, right, who was last photographed with Prime Minister Modi over there. Now, I'm going to quickly move on back again to, to the realm of literature uh, and, and, and ask each of my guests over here um, something that I will explain by example, which is that I would love to write... Um, I was fascinated by the Nirav Modi scam, I have to admit. And I believe it would make an excellent novel. I don't mean the scam, which was a, a piece of incredible fiction to begin with. But I imagine the story unfolding from the eyes of his wife, Ami. You know, the well-heeled, ambitious South Bombay society hostess who helps her husband build up his jewelry empire. At his behest, she also signs up as a director in his company. And while the husband is expanding his career, she is the sly, charming hostess who's inviting you know, the YPO guests over, helping him uh, you know, build his business up. Kind of character who, in a different time zone, would have invited the attentions of Henry James. You know? But then she discovers one day that her husband is not the man that she married. Her husband is, in fact, a great scamster. He scammed this country of two billion dollars. The truth comes stinging home because she signed on as a director in this company. She too is held accountable and is one of India's most wanted people. Now for me, if I was to base a novel on this situation, would open here. Ami Modi reinventing her life in a city like New York, where she's dodging legal authorities from India and slowly transforming herself into one of New York's preeminent hostesses. Because this is the true story of modern India. It's about 
scam artists, and it's about the people who get away. Is that something? Is Would that you write you? a book? No, no, sit, sit, no I, it's a movie, actually. It's, or it could be a Netflix series. Uh, uh, Ami, you know. Uh, it is absolutely mind-boggling. It has every element you can think of for a long-running series like, uh, like Dynasty, for example, or Beyond. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, I like, like Dynasty. Oh. I think it sounds like, to me, like the, the first ever divorce box set. You know, like <laughs> Jeff Bezos is divorcing, yes, uh, is, is divorcing his story. wife, a fantastic story. Yeah. And he released this bizarre statement that said after a period of loving exploration, they had decided to separate. And everybody I know tried to work out what, was, what euphemism was loving exploration. What did it actually mean? And was it... I mean, the mind boggles, but I think we know what he it's meant, like and that is going to be the most expensive divorce in history. Yeah. Are the like Modi's getting divorced? It, well, it's the, the new version of it. Are the Modi's getting divorced? Which is the extraordinary thing, they're not. And also, extraordinary enough, their life continues completely undisturbed. I know that they have their kids at school in New York. I know that they have called up my friends and said, what are you doing over the weekend? Would you like to go skiing? These are people who've scammed this country for two billion. Now, you know, it's very easy to lose the narrative in the numbers. But when you actually look at the fact that this is somebody's life savings, that these people are now going on a ski holiday on, that makes my blood boil, you know? That's something that makes me really, really angry. But uh, India right now for writers, I can't think of a better time. We have scams, we have scandal, we have all manner of the most awful things going on. And but you also have libel laws, I presume. And the libel laws are not what they are uh, uh, back home, uh, Rachel, for you. It's really the onus is on the person who is, uh, who is being defamed to prove his or her innocence in court, and most prefer not to take that route because a lot else can come out uh, during that cross-questioning. It's normally settled out of court. There are very, very few libel cases that have actually gone the whole hog. Sometimes it takes 30 years. So it doesn't quite work in the same way. It's not swift and, and you pay out. And, but the, the amount of money that Siddharth is uh, talking about, humongous. But at the same time, when we dis did discuss the wedding of the century briefly, and what Siddharth felt was uh, perhaps an, a, a vulgar display of wealth, uh, which uh, he does think. Uh, it's strange that in a city like Mumbai, you talked about your taxi driver stop, uh, stopping, I mean, pointing out to that building. It happens over and over again since I live in Mumbai, that there are people who come from small town cities uh, just to see that 27-story building, to take selfies with it, to post pictures of it. They are not disgusted. They are awestruck. They're awestruck. So when this wedding was taking place and streets were actually shut down, uh, a, along a route where there were slums on both sides of the street, uh, it would, I was asked by someone that what if one of the slum dwellers, just to register their disgust or their complete uh, shock that this could be happening, there were women there wearing uh, diamonds in the billion, I'm not even talking about in millions, what if someone had thrown an egg or a tomato or something? Well, uh, there was a Mossad level security, so a question of anything uh, a, a, a worse than a tomato or an egg that didn't arise. But nobody did. They were taking videos and pictures, and uh, they were saying how fantastic, oh. including I how wonderful for a father to do this for his daughter. I've heard it with my own ears. I think so there's something happening me. in India. Everyone wants to be them. I it's not that they want to pull them down. They want I'm, to be I'm exempting them. myself from that <laughs> they equation. Want to be them. I think yeah. that what you're confusing is a sort of celebrity Instagram culture with... No, the slum dwellers are not on Instagram. You, I, I have to point out. They're not Instagram. This is not about the fame. This is I really, think having yeah. a selfie... No, it's a fascination. But that I think what we are here to talk about is whether you can render in print or between hard covers this world in a sympathetic way, whether it's really worth celebrating in literature. It doesn't have to celebrate it. It doesn't have to damn it. It doesn't have to be sympathetic. It has to be what it is. That's our job. 
we are not sitting in judgment. We are not judges. We are writers. We are not there to tell the crowd, look, these are bad people and you've got to hate them at the end of this book or they, they must no. suffer at the end of this uh, book. You are no, there not, to tell the truth that as wasn't you see my it. Point, but that's I, it. The distinction I wanted to make is bet bet between someone who wants to stand in front of the tower and, and have a picture or sat, but do you really want to read about these? The, 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 that's the difference. Everybody wants a selfie, but... Do yeah, you really, you does everybody want to read in a multi-layered work of fiction about that character who built that tower? Well, we talk about even some of the, the sagas which go back uh, to uh, like the Chinese, the British who went to China and uh, um, made a lot of money, the opium traders and their family, the Jardine family. The saga of their family is fascinating then, it was fascinating, it's fascinating today, it'll continue to be fascinating. It depends on how a writer tackles the subject. It's the talent of the writer, the words used, the ideas communicated, the world that you draw okay. a reader okay. into, no, okay. and that's all that matters. Okay, Qu moving it away from India then, we know that the Russian oligarchs raped their country's industries for their own gain. Do you think that they are worthy subjects of literature? Yes, I mean, sympathetic, et cetera, et cetera. Or do you feel that you like your Indian ones because they, you can make them into your oh, own heroes No, and I don't think that I... But I you wouldn't see, know you enough. I wouldn't know make. anything I, about the Russian oligarchs. I see them on the beaches of Goa when they come in and they completely take over uh, Goa, Morjim, like they own it. I see it all, but I, I have to distance myself as a writer, I cannot be involved in every life I see, otherwise I won't be able to write about it. There has to be some level of objectivity. You see things, you observe, you're an observer. That's how I see my job as a writer. If that story fascinates me, I will write it. If it does not interest me, I can just walk away, I can look at it, but I don't necessarily have to pass a strong comment, or if I want to do that, I can do it politically through my columns and over Twitter, which is what I use a lot. Uh, I use that a lot for, yeah. but fiction is is not about that. It's about storytelling for yeah. me, so and my, my, I, I will try I'm and tell my story the best I can. I don't think that the billionaires, the bolly bolligarchs, the oligarchs are interesting and worthy of writing about simply because they are rich. That's that's all I'm saying. Most of them. But are Why crooks. should we assume they're boring? Crooks. Why should we assume? Uh, why well, should we think that crook is in not literature uh, to write about? Yeah, you know who does that very well in your country is Edward Saint Aubin, right? Melrose. Um, um, his entire chronicles um, of Pat Patrick Mel Melrose's uh, descent into drug addiction. Yeah, well, it, they're not actually, he's not right, he's writing about a sort of milieu, a cultured, decadent milieu of the sort of uh, the, the entitled rich, but not the very, the get, having got rich quick lot who are, you know, the industrialists, the billionaires. This is the old, decaying English aristocracy and the damage that they do. It'll be great to see uh, crazy rich uh, desis, crazy rich Indians, because I think it would, uh, uh, the, the crazy rich Up Asians. Beyond. <laughs> we're, 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 it, it would absolutely, you know, it'll be something so bizarre that people outside the charmed circle would not believe. Like watching uh, crazy rich Asians for me was fascinating. We've been going to Singapore for at least 30 years. And this is uh, a different dynamic within that society. And similarly in India, the dynamics have changed and they've changed to an extent that uh, most of us don't recognize this new Indian uh, yeah. with so much money. Yeah. And uh, well, it takes, uh, as they say, seven generations to get used to wealth and yeah. to know what to do with it yeah. and to be comfortable with, with wealth. So we're at that curve right now in India where our middle class, our middle class is, is one of the biggest and most affluent middle classes on earth with purchasing power for good, bad, indifferent. They are consumers, perhaps one of the largest consumer markets in the world. Uh, the brands are coming in, but at the same time, parallelly, I think there's a huge, huge revival of our, uh, our crafts and skills also, a lot of it subsidized because of education, awareness, and uh, it's a parallel thing. So we don't have to despair just yet. Okay, so you know, Shobha, one thing I will add to that is that also that the middle class that you speak of 
are also significantly more generous than the super rich. And I see that because I help out with an animal charity in Goa. And when I go out with my begging bowl to my wealthy friends, uh, I will be handed a day old chapati. Uh, and when I go to, to, and I put up on Facebook, you know, we have a calf that was run over by, you know, something, can have somebody. It's the people on Facebook, you know, readers who are turning around and saying, here's 500 rupees, here's 1,000 rupees, here's, you know. That is what uh, I have seen in India. It's that the middle class is the genuinely, and it's evidenced by the fact that we have one of the lowest rates of philanthropy amongst the super rich in India. The super rich in India are also the stingiest. And when you ask them why, they turn around and say, it's because we've only ha just had it. There's, I mean, the distinction in, in England is old money and new money, and I don't know to what extent that applies here. And, you know, we have a, you have a caste... I, I can't opine about you, but we still have a class system, but the class distinctions are being elided by wealth. And actually, the, I think the top three or four on the Sunday Times Rich List are Indian. Yeah. So, you know, th this is the, the country where the money is growing and coming at you fastest. So I understand and, that and we have to open up oh. the, the panel is what I've been instructed. So there's a question, ma'am, please. So this is a question for you from the Game Changing series. And this is Saurabh Poochre, Jaipur. In the past year, there are new medical, engineering, and IIT. Love story or mythology, and why is there no future in any way of writing? The question is that there are a lot of young writers who are emerging from our medical schools and from engineering colleges. And, uh, why are they, if, if, am I correct, why are they not choosing subjects uh, outside of love stories and mythology. mythology? Well, I think the writers are ambitious enough to... Uh, yeah, oh, most definitely, there are more voices emerging out of young India than ever before, mainly because uh, publishing is supporting them. And if the publishing houses do not support young voices, they have the guts and often crowdfunding efforts to self-publish. Yeah. And they are uh, marketing their own books, and they're just going ahead and expressing themselves and making their books available and finding a vast readership. I think it's fantastic. Shobha, can you actually it's qualify fantastic. that with certain examples of books that yeah. you've read that you know you can actually substantiate I that? I wouldn't know the books that she's okay. referring to because... Uh, I mean, anything that you've been reading recently that, it, it that goes out of me? the sort of... Yes, that you find interesting within young writers, which is not about IIT, IITians falling in love. Well, that's a wonderful formula that has been struck and made a lot of IITians very rich authors. So I would imagine it's a safe subject to tackle, but mm. if you're asking me, do I know of one such other mm. uh, phenomenal writer emerging out of IIM, IIT? Mm. Uh, frankly, I don't. Mm. Mythology, again, a lot of the boy or young men, mm. maybe they're here, who have done exceptionally well, uh, have used uh, mythology to, uh, to, to great advantage mm. and made it accessible to young India in a way that you don't have to know Sanskrit to access our, our old texts and mythology. So I think it's, it's fantastic. I mean, all sorts of writing and all kinds of writers should coexist in a world where voices need to be heard across the board. Question, ma'am. Uh, hello. Um, so based on this discussion, I think we've established that there is a certain specificity of experience when it comes to writing about rich people, for example, and that this experience isn't easily accessible. So um, there is a lot of theory about how it's problematic to represent poor people yeah. when you're speaking for them. Yeah. But would you apply the same logic to rich people? Is it, do you think it's problematic for people who are not rich to write about rich people? Do you say that only rich people should write about rich people? Are they the only ones who can do justice to it? Because again, when people who are not rich are maybe writing about rich people, there might be the, the image of rich people that's... No, I, I, I'd like to just bring a popular culture into this because it is the most potent form of influencing uh, cultural uh, standards. And it, through Bollywood movies, even the, in the 50s and 60s, there was a certain representation of rich Indians, which was completely nuts. You know, it was so nuts because the people 
possibly writing about them had only one version of it. It was the Raj Kapoor version of the Amir Log Kaise Rehte Hain, which was a total distortion. Today, the small town India is being represented most wonderfully in Bollywood films, and the voices are very authentic because they're from within. Those movies were not from within. So there's a way of writing from within, and there's a, a way of writing from without, from the outside. And both can succeed or can't succeed depending on the talent of the writer. And Rachel? I think this is a very good question. I think that if you, you're allowed to satirize the super rich, but you are not allowed to satirize the super poor. It's absolutely taboo. Um, I wrote this trilogy about the super rich in the town and then in, in the country. And I did it from the perspective of somebody who'd moved to an area and then it became like Malabar Hills. And when it came out in America, they tried to work out how you were going to market a novel, uh, a series set in Notting Hell, which I called Notting Hell. And there, we decided to go with sort of every city in the world has a Notting Hell. You know, there's an area where the super rich live, where the, the mummies drive around in their tanks with their nannies and their chauffeurs going from Pilates <coughs> to the blow dry, to, to lunch, to pick up, to you know, get ready to go out in the evening. And at one point the BBC asked me if as a social experiment for charity, I would live on one pound a day. And I agreed to do this and they got various so-called celebrities to live on one pound a day for a whole week. And we were living in, with very, very, very poor families. We were, we were we had to go and they took all our possessions. They took everything out of our suitcases that was edible. And they took away our phones, our wallets. And then they said, we're going to give you your budget for the week. And I hand, held, held up my hand thinking I was going to get a wad of notes. And they gave me two pound coins. And that was the amount of money I had to buy food for the week. That was what this poor family, the budget they had for one person one day. Anyway. After I did this, it came out on BBC One, and then I was interviewed by Michael Burke, who had gone to Africa and, dis and really re um, revealed to the world the extent of the famine in Africa. He was the BBC journalist, and so he, they sent him to interview me. It was obviously an accident waiting to happen. And he said, and how has it been in Notting Hill since you came back from this experience, and what do your friends think about what you did? So I said, well, I told him the truth and I said, well, my friends, you know, these rich women and these sort of men who ran businesses and these media moguls, they were very jealous, I said, of what I had done, that the experience I had was an experience they will never have in their lives. And then I said, you know, they were jealous and envious that I had been on poverty safari and they were never... You can imagine when poverty, the words poverty safari went into the Radio Times, that we you know this is a story. But if this was true, this is, you but know, you the, know you can, that the rich in cannot buy some experiences. That's what I'm saying. So, you know, the rich aren't universally lucky and blessed. They all have their shit. Excuse me. But you know, Rachel, uh, the reason I don't, I mean I, I mean, I agree with you, but I'd like to also add that, you know, in, in Mumbai, there's uh, something called poverty tourism, where they are actually taking very wealthy people into the slums and saying this is how oh, you know a certain know milieu of people uh, uh, lives. And part of it is, I, and I do understand that there is a genuine sympathy that they want to understand at that, you know. Yeah, but they don't live there. They don't live there. But I mean, I don't know what's worse, sort of going in a fancy car, you know, watching how people live, uh, and then getting back into your fan fancy car and going off, off to the Taj and having a drink. Uh, you know, it's not even a social experiment. It's a way to sort of distract yourself while you're on holiday in India. I mean, I can't think of anything yeah. more insulting. <coughs> Sorry, question, ma'am? Hi, can I ask a question first? Sorry. Uh, okay. So uh, I do not particularly have a problem with the rich being written off or the rich being super glorified. What, however, I would like to understand is why the world is so obsessed with India being a poverty-stricken country. Why is it that only the white tigers and the slumdog millionaires make, make it to the Oscars and the Booker's Prize? Why can't we see India as more than just a poverty-stricken country? Because I think people are essentially... Uh, <laughs> 
unprepared, jealous, unprepared. You know, they don't want to open up the conversation on that table to say that you know, brown people who have always driven our cabs are now the people who own the cab company. You know, so that narrative for it to change is going to be, uh, you don't know. And and the thing is, it is not about race. It's about class and money. The minute Indians are on the other side of the, the table and are actually calling the shots, they're going to make sure that you know you ain't getting there either. So it's not really demarcated by skin color, by Western and Eastern uh, kind of narratives. It's about the fact that, look, now I have the pie, and I'm going to be cutting it, and I, these are the slices you can have. I, I'm not sure about that. I think it has a lot to do with race and color. Because I remember a few years ago when we were in London, and uh, a, a, a Jaguar passed by, and uh, there was a person crossing the street next to us and nudged and said, a beautiful car. And my husband very proudly said, uh, yes, it's Indian owned, <laughs> the Jaguar. And the, he nearly fell off, the, you know, almost got himself killed because he said, it's not possible. I mean, Jaguar, an Indian owned car, I mean, it's not possible. So there are all these various layers and barriers uh, which, which, which exists. We should not pretend that they don't exist. It's exactly the way that when the Chinese, and uh, before that, the Japanese, when they had a, a lot more money than they do right now, when they would go to Paris, and some of the fanciest, newtiest stores would shut down uh, for them, uh, because they were the ones with the money when Europe is still <laughs> you know, going through what it's going through, and of course with Brexit, let's not even go there. The money came from the East, and it was making everybody extremely uncomfortable. It's a fact. And I mean, they would curse them now? the minute they left, and they would say, oh my God, but we need their money. Yeah. Uh, but they were dismissive, they looked down on them, they found them crass, they found them rude, as they do most Indians, and that kind of prejudice exists. And uh, it's, it's, I think, silly to put on blinkers and be in denial and say, oh, no, it's, it has nothing to do with color and race. It very much does. Rachel, would, sorry, would you want to respond to that? I, I can't respond on why are there no middle-class Indian movies in Hollywood. I'm sure there are. Sorry, um, question? Yes, question. Who has? Yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, so I just, uh, building a little more on the conundrum about how the rich are presented, and there's always this hollowness or emptiness even, I mean, not just in literature, but even in superhero movies when you talk about Bruce Wayne. Do you think as writers we need to present the rich maybe in a more realistic and not just in terms of lifestyle, but maybe relationships or something where we don't present them in a pity or a sympathetic and that will be a little more celebratory for us also to emulate them or follow them and rather not connect with them just because, oh, you know what, it's a pity to be them. Rachel, would you like to respond? Well, I keep, I mean, the, I can't remember the, exactly the line from F. Scott Fitzgerald, but, you know, he has this line about how the rich, you know, they had this carelessness about them, and then they just went back to their money after they'd left their country broken. I mean, that, there is no better um, line to describe what's going on in my country, you know, which was basically broken by rich old Etonians. I'm not speaking of any family relations here. And... Um, and, you know, they are protected, they are insulated by their wealth. And I think when we talk about, you know, the how unsympathetic they are, it's because they always have their nut. When I wrote my Notting Hill novel, I remember a rich person saying to me, you know, you have, you have your nut, which is, you know, your capital, and you never spend it, and you've always got your nut, so you're safe. You know, the, the fact that they're safe means there's not that jeopardy around their lives and what happens to their lives in print, or in reality, and therefore you cannot relate to them in the same way that you can relate to, you know, your your uncle or your brother, you know, whose life can really disappear overnight. They their lives don't. They're safe. You know, they're offshore. Ma'am at the back. Yes, sorry. Question. Somebody can get a mic to the lady there. Last question. Thank you. And can it be from a gentleman, please? <laughs> oh yeah. I'm a woman, and I'm proud to be a woman. Uh, actually, I came to know um, Ms. Shubha Day through the TV serial called uh, Swabhiman. Mm -hmm. And my question is related to that. Actually, I'm forwarding a question which was asked to me by a student from Bangladesh when I visited Dhaka a couple of years back, that our literature or the TV serials or the films, they are supposed to be a representative of the culture that we have in our society. And the way the TV serials are showing the rich and the elites, 
that they are always indulged in greed. Sorry, ma'am, I'm trying to connect it to the overall conversation. Can you help me focus that question yeah. to the subject? I'm coming to the point okay. that the way they reach the elite class is shown in the TV serials. They are always shown to be very greedy. They are always indulged in family feud. Even the younger ones, they don't respect the elder ones. Mm -hmm. so, my, so the question which I was asked, do they represent the larger culture? Or are we not representing something wrong before our audience? Shoba, would you like to respond? I, I, I'm really sorry, ma'am, but I haven't understood your question at all. It's about uh, the, uh, the rich being misrepresented in TV serials. Is that what you're saying? Uh, this is yes. one. Is, is what is the it, representation it accurate or not accurate? In connection when I can only talk about the one that you mentioned, which I had written, uh, which had more Swabhiman. than 500 episodes of uh, uh, um, Swabiman. Uh, it was on a government channel. It was the most popular uh, serial at the time. It's shown across the world, even today. And people connected with it because I suppose there were insights about the rich and also the not so rich. Uh, which they could relate to. Otherwise, it would simply have alienated audiences, which it didn't. I tried my best to be as fair and as, uh, as accurate in the representation as I could as, a, as the writer of the serial. And for the sake of gender representation and for gender parity, can we have a gentleman, a man, a uh, cis male? Sorry, yes, sir, please. I, go ahead. Hi. So my question is that uh, I have read The White Tiger, continuing, and I believe that it is not just about poverty. It actually compares. And when you were talking, your question, sir. Yeah. So when you were talking, I was constantly thinking about how he compares. Right. So I wanted to uh, ask you why is the novel just taken in that context? That it, you know, like uh, it looks down upon India. Why not? It, why don't we see it as a comparative novel? as such? Why don't we look at it from a broader picture? I mean, I think uh, Adiga should be able to re respond to it rather than any of us, because that question should be addressed to him, but you were a good friend of his, so maybe you can talk a little about it. What was Adiga thinking? Was it, was so it a novel written to put India down? Or was he, I think it's a very powerful book, but I don't think the intention was to put India down. I think it was to draw attention to the disparities and the inequalities, and he did a fantastic job. That's what I feel, but uh, You know, I've Siddharth. spoken to Arvind a lot about it, um, and he told me this thing which stayed with me, that you know, when he came back to India, um, he was traveling a lot by, you know, public, like local buses all across India. And the version of life that he said, you know, going past the people who have no access to television, there's one story that stayed with me, is that he was traveling at night in the buses, and on the highways, they don't always stop at night um, because bandits can come in. And so people just you know, use the restroom within, within the bus, and then the bus continues for 12 hours like that. And he says you know, that, in a sense, that became a metaphor for what was really going on, that the bus is just going on, but there's so much crap on it. And, um, so I don't, I don't really think he was actually putting the country down. I think he was trying to recognize a reality um, that a lot of us here, English-speaking, privileged, elite people like myself, might not necessarily be able to access and see. So I have a great sympathy uh, for that version of a uh, story, but although I'm not capable of writing it myself. Last question. Oh, we've done the last question. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for coming thank out you, in the thank cold. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful thank for you. your time. Thank you so much to our wonderful, wonderful panelists. Please join me in thanking Rachel Johnson, Shobade, and Siddhartha Van Changvi for being with us today for this wonderful panel. Thank you so much. And thank you to Patrika Game Changer Series, our wonderful sponsor. Um, Shoba will be signing books um, at the author signing desk. Please, can you clear the way for our authors to get to the desk because we only have a few minutes before our...